Good afternoon again. I'm Stephen Myers, Associate Vice Provost at Ohio State, and I lead the Office of Outreach and Engagement. I'd like to welcome you to today's Provost Discovery Themes Lecture, which will feature President Mary Robinson, and she'll be uh, involved in a conversation with WOSU's Mike Thompson, but also uh, be, be taking your questions. This marks the final event of the 2019 uh, Community Engagement Conference. There, we've had about, between this and this, the uh, conference and this lecture, around uh, 700 people uh, registered. Thanks to all of you who have been here the last couple of days for the Engagement Conference. We've had uh, over 120 presentations of uh, teams uh, representing faculty, staff, students, and their community par partners presenting their work. And these partnerships are involved, uh, really represent a diversity of ideas and talents coming de together to solve complex challenges. And it's through those kinds of partnerships it really helps inform our work in ways that we can become more relevant, innovative, and impactful. Now, I mentioned this is the Provost Discovery Themes Lecture. The uh, Discovery Themes is a research, teaching, and engagement initiative that began back in 2012 at Ohio State. It's probably one of the largest unparalleled investments in Ohio State history. And what it has done is seek, uh, sought to bring together uh, groups and bring new talent uh, in to form networks to really address the compelling challenges we face in the 21st century in more robust ways. In fact, in conjunction with this conference, last night, the university launched the new Ohio Sustainability Institute, which is an initiative that came out of the Discovery Themes. So let's give a round of applause, excitement for the new Discovery, that uh, initiative. The purpose of the Provost Discovery Themes lecture program is to bring uh, eminent, prominent, uh, voices to campus to discuss really complex challenges and try to foster conversation between the uh, campus and the community. I'd like to recognize the planning committee both for the lecture and for the, uh, the conference. Uh, so will you join me in giving them a round of applause? I'd also like to thank our interpreters, Emily Ott and Tiffany Hedges. Emily and Tiffany. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Executive Vice President and Provost Bruce McFerrin, the Chief Academic Officer of Ohio State. He's responsible for an extensive portfolio of programs, including the Discovery Themes. Please join me in welcoming Provost Bruce McFerrin. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon, all, and welcome to the Provost Discovery Themes Lecture for this semester. It's our great honor to welcome the Honorable Mary Robinson back to The Ohio State University. Just over a decade ago, in 2008, President Robinson presented a lecture in Mershon Auditorium entitled Women and International Policy to celebrate the 65th anniversary of our International Studies Program. Uh, growing up with two older brothers and two younger brothers, the only girl in the family, she says she's always had an interest in human rights. <laughs> Educated at Trinity King's, Inn, King's Inns Dublin and the Harvard Law School, she's an academic, a legislator, and a barrister. As the first woman to serve as the president of Ireland, she said she dedicated her presidency to having a space for those who felt marginalized in Ireland. She brought together communities in Northern Ireland with those from the Republic of Ireland to bring about a peace. Her leadership has expanded around the world and finding a space for those who are marginalized seems to be a theme in her life's work. Along with the late Nelson Mandela, she's a founding member and the current chair of the Elders a group of world leaders who work for peace and human rights. She has served as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. She served also as the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy on Climate Change and has written a new book, Climate Justice. Her accomplishments and accolades are remarkable 
And it's truly hard to imagine how one person could make such a profound impact on our world. Our thanks to Stephen Myers, his team in outreach and engagement, to Elena Irwin and Linda Weavers, I'll call them out directly, who uh, co-chaired the two-day community engagement conference on partnering for a resilient and sustainable future. That theme and our launch, as Stu uh, Stephen mentioned, of the Institute last night bring us naturally to President Robinson's presentation this afternoon. We're privileged to hear her insights. Please join me in welcoming back to our community the Honorable Mary Robinson. Joining President Robinson as moderator of this afternoon's dialogue is Mr. Mike Thompson, who's the Chief Content Director for News and Public Affairs at WOSU. He's worked in public and commercial radio and television in New York, Massachusetts, and Ohio, and has earned numerous awards for investigative, enterprising, and feature reporting. Mike earned a degree in broadcast journalism from Syracuse University and an MBA from The Ohio State University. So how about a round of applause for our moderator, Mike Thompson. Well, thank you very much. You know, I would argue that our biggest problem as a species is not that our planet is warming, it's getting people to care that our planet is warming. Look what we're up against. We have a rise of nationalism around the world. We have civil wars in Syria and in Yemen, we have Brexit, we have trade wars, our government is shut down, we have Rudy Giuliani taking the foot out of his mouth at least once a week, and our biggest controversy this week is did an NFL referee cost the Saints a chance to go to the Super Bowl? <laughs> so how can we get climate change into that equation somehow? But that's what we're gonna to try to do here today. We need to get folks to care. There is hope, however, not for the Saints or for Rudy, but there is hope that people are starting to care. A poll out this week shows that 72% of Americans now realize that climate change affects them personally. President Robinson, you have made it your life's work now to inform people about climate change and to make them care and to get them to act. Now, and throughout your career, you've gone from, from Dublin City Council to President of Ireland to your work with the UN. You've fought for women on juries. You've fought for gay rights, for family planning rights. How did you come to this as your cause? In fact, I came quite late, and I do admit this. Uh, I served, after my seven years as President of Ireland, um, I became the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, as you heard. And it was a, a, a big responsibility to give that leadership on human rights, on human rights, gender, rights of people with disabilities, um, uh, um, uh, indigenous people's rights, 400 million indigenous people worldwide, and so on. And another part of the UN was dealing with climate change. And I don't think I made a single speech. I don't remember anything. I never made the connection between climate change and human rights. So after my five-year term as High Commissioner, I went to New York to form a small NGO called Realizing Rights, where I would work with a small number of colleagues on economic and social rights in African countries, right to health, right to food, women, peace, and security issues. And that was in about starting in 2003. And in 2003, 2004, 2005, I kept hearing the same sentence in different African countries. I was also honorary president of Oxfam. And Oxfam would ask me to go to various things in Africa. And the sentence was, things are so much worse now. And what was meant was, we just don't know what's happening. We don't know when to sow. We don't know when to harvest. We can't produce our food. And also, Everything has changed for the worse. We have to go further for water during drought. The drought is followed by flash flooding, which destroys the school. Is God punishing us? You know, what, what, what's the problem? And I realized, you know, at that late stage, if I could put it that way, that actually climate change is a threat multiplier. It's disrupting their lives much, much more than in Ireland or in the United States, where I'd studied and quite familiar with, um, we don't have the same, well, certainly we didn't in 2003, 2004, 2005. And uh, the injustice of it really struck me. I have that strong sense of justice 
starting with the brothers in Mayo a long, long time ago. So um, uh, the fact that they're disproportionately affected because they live in vulnerable parts of the world and they are not responsible. They don't drive cars, they don't manufacture, they don't have central heating. So um, I decided this is the human rights issue that I'm going to work on for the rest of my life. Uh, partly because I had been reading about climate change, I'd been informing myself, and I realized how serious it was. There many, we've seen many approaches to fighting against climate change, to get people to realize that it's happening, to get people to change how they do, whether it's environmentalists going after big corporations or uh, energy producers. Climate justice, which is the, the title of your book, Climate Justice, how is that different than these other efforts? What separates you? Climate justice is very people-centered. It recognizes, and that was the lesson I learned in my work in African countries, that climate change was actually affecting people's lives now, uh, making them poorer, uh, depriving them of access to food, uh, making them have to go further for water and firewood, uh, maybe displacing them entirely because of floods or small, small island states, hurricanes. And uh, so it, it links human rights, development, and climate change. And, the other thing that I learned very early on was the gender dimensions of climate change. When you undermine very poor people's poverty, you know, the, the, they're living very poorly anyway, when it's undermined by the destructive impacts of climate, then who puts the food on the table? It's still the woman has to try to feed her family. She has to go further in drought for water. She has to go further for firewood. And uh, the so social roles of women and men are different. Um, and therefore, um, the, the climate aggravates their lives. And so at an early stage, we uh, brought together women ministers who attend the conferences on climate um, to form a group of women ministers on gender and climate change to bring out the gender dimensions. And um, uh, climate justice says that we have to uh, act on climate change, respecting human rights and respecting and having a gender perspective. And climate action must also respect uh, human rights. And now that we've got to the stage where there's a broad recognition that we need to move to a clean energy world, we need to get that clean energy to a very, very significant proportion of our population who don't have access to electricity at all, whether cleaner or fossil fuel electricity. They don't have it, they don't switch the switch. A billion people, at least. And 2.3 billion cook on dirty cook stoves, on charcoal and coal and animal dung and wood. And they inhale and die from um, the smoke inhalation and their children who are around them while they're cooking are also affected. These are the possibilities as we move forward to a clean energy world that we can also tackle poverty. So that's an opportunity. You mentioned all those folks who don't have access to electricity rather than just give those folks over to the fossil fuel industry, you could, you should, play, you could have it almost like a clean slate. This could be renewable first yeah. in these areas. And they're, 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 they haven't got the electricity because they're off the grids. Mm -hmm. And we have now the off-grid solutions. We have lights, we have units, we, have, we can put solar panels everywhere. We, you know, we, we've got hydro, small hydro. Um, we must be careful that the projects are suitable for the communities and, and that the communities know what's happening and, 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 and it's discussed with them. I remember being at a conference a few years ago where there were women from Mali um, who were complaining because an NGO had brought them cook stoves and given them their cook stoves, but they said, but we don't cook like that, <laughs> they're not good to us. And so, you know, there has to be a lot of participation. I gather you've been having this community um, involvement in this conference and I'm all for community participation, community involvement, and particularly listening to and you know, learning from communities what they want um, by way of um, what will improve their lives. The, the main characters in your book are women. Um, are they, and you, they, they travel around the world spreading this message that climate change is, is real mm. and we need to do something about it, it's a matter of justice. Are they better ambassadors for this issue than say someone like Al Gore, who has done a lot with his book and movie, An Inconvenient Truth? Are they, are they better? Is it a different message? Is it a more effective message? I'm not sure if I thought about it in those terms. I mean, I wanted to bring home 
uh, the human dimension of climate change by writing stories about people that I'd got to know and actually got to admire. And it's true that in the, the 11 stories in the book, nine of them are about women, but they're also two good men that we can, we can talk about. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the women, um, really what they uh, show is great courage and resilience and hope, despite the fact that they're completely undermined in their communities. Let me give you the two stories um, that are of women here in the United States. The first story is a story of um, a woman who was affected by Hurricane Katrina. She lived in East Biloxi, and as she put it, she was on the wrong side of the tracks. She was African-American, living in a poor community, but she had a small salon for hair and nails, and it was a go-to place for local women. And it was completely destroyed, as was her home. And she lived in a FEMA caravan for a while, and she managed to rescue a broken antique table that she stuck together again, and some faded photographs. That's all she had from after Hurricane Katrina. And she became a climate activist because things were so bad in East Biloxi. Nobody was coming to support them. They had to start growing vegetables themselves. They had to um, start a, a, a small um, uh, um, um, credit union um, type approach. Um, and she, she, she speaks about being an accidental activist and coming to Copenhagen, which is where I met her, and uh, was very impressed by her. The other story in the United States is from Alaska, and the uh, woman there is a scientist, Patricia Cochran, um, a very good climate scientist, but also a native Alaskan, and she's been watching her community um, affected terribly by climate change over a, quite a long number of years, and their surrounds affected, the ice melting, the incursion of seawater, the villages that have to move now in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And this is happening in this country, but there's a lack of awareness that it's now it's happening, not um, in the future. Everyone points to Florida will be the place where climate yes. change will be felt first, but it's being felt in Alaska right now, more so than Florida or the coast of the Gulf Coast. Well, it's different. I think uh, Florida, when there's flooding, and we've had flooding in Texas, flooding in various places, um, uh, and the flooding is worse now. The precipitation, the, ra the rainfall is much heavier. The, the water is warmer, mm -hmm. and so the effect is. And, and that's, climate change doesn't cause totally these problems. It aggravates them. It's a threat multiplier on top of conditions that are there. And if the conditions are conditions that make you vulnerable, you're more vulnerable. And that's what's happening all over the world. You also write about two women. One is Norwegian and one Swedish. is Swedish. Yes. And the other one's from Africa. Yes. Both herders, one cattle, one yeah. reindeer. And climate change is affecting them both yeah. in similar ways, even though they're very different and from very yeah. different parts of the world. Yeah. Yes, the, the Swedish young woman, and actually the woman from Chad is also young. They're all in their early 30s, these women. are. In fact, um, Jani from Sweden is 28 when I met her. She um, is a reindeer herder, but she's also a graduate in chemistry from the University of Gothenburg. And she went back to her community and found that they were very affected. And she explained, um, she, she was on a panel with me um, about three years ago in the European Parliament in Brussels. And uh, it was a panel of the Women's Committee of the European Parliament on gender and climate justice. And I was very pleased the words climate justice were being used. And uh, when Jani got up to speak, she explained that she was in her beautiful costume as a member of the Sami people, them, the indigenous people in northern Sweden. And she explained that the reindeer can smell the nurture under feet of snow. They have no problem. But with the changing climate, it, there would be snow, and then it would warm, and then it would become cold again quite rapidly, and there would be a thin sheet of ice on top of the snow, and the reindeer can't smell through the ice. So they would go further, so would the herders, and both reindeers and herders would fall over thin ice that had, um, that had melted because of the changing conditions. And a lot of herders have lost their lives, and they've lost a lot of reindeer, obviously. And she was talking about this. And then, I mean, remember, a 28-year-old, and then she says, um, to the European Parliament delegates who are there, members of the European Parliament, she says, and I'm so glad that now you're having this important discussion on gender and climate justice. Pause. What took you so long? And, you know, it was just wonderful to hear that voice, you know. A 32-year-old. And she got a big clap. Yeah. Um, the uh, young indigenous woman from Chad in um, Africa, Chad is in 
Central Africa, French speaking as a foreign language. They have their own languages, of course. Um, she's a member of, the, um, of a pastoralist community that uh, herd cattle all around Lake Chad. The problem is that Lake Chad is disappearing. Lake Chad has lost 85% of its water, and it's a huge, was a huge lake. And so this is causing great hardship. And she's become a young indigenous leader in conferences on climate. Um, it's wonderful to hear her. And she's always so beautifully dressed in her African um, clothes. I, I, I joke when I'm in Africa with African women, nobody can compete with them when it comes to you know, the color and the style of their, of their dress. But um, um, Hindu is her name, Hindu Omaru Ibrahim. Uh, it's unusual in the pastoralist community that she comes from for a girl to be educated but her mother was determined and her father was supportive that she would be educated. And so she went to the city to get the schooling because there was no schooling in her area. And she was um, bullied at school because the girls claimed she smelt of milk because she would go home um, in, 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 the, in the holiday break and she would milk cows with her grandmother and then come back to the school and the girls didn't want to sit beside her. And so as a 11, 12 year old, she had to stand up for herself and counter that bullying, which I think made her the activist she became. She's now co-chair of the Indigenous panel. She's 33 years old, co-chair of the Indigenous panel um, in the conferences on climate, speaks up for the Indigenous knowledge. You know, we know, she says, the weather, we understand, we have this knowledge and that has to be combined with scientific knowledge and we'll get better solutions. So it's more than just farmers complaining about the weather or complaining about crop prices or yields decline, mm. you know, suppressing crop mm. prices. It's, it's more than that, and these folks realize that. Well, that was something that I said when I was with, before the conference on, in Copenhagen on climate, which some of you will remember perhaps was an important climate conference because people thought this would be the breakthrough. Uh, President Obama flew in, other presidents flew in for the final discussions, but actually there wasn't any breakthrough. It took years later, in 2015, the Paris Climate Agreement. But Copenhagen, which was in 2009, um, had a lot of preparation beforehand, including by uh, civil society around the world, and Oxfam was organizing hearings. And I was a member of the elders at the time. This was in 2008 and 2009, and the elders were formed in 2007. And I was with Archbishop Tutu, who was chair of the elders, on a panel listening to five African farmers. And the interesting thing is, Four of the five were women, which is the reality. An awful lot of the farming in Africa is done by women. And I well remember their stories very briefly. Um, the man was a um, pastoralist from Kenya um, with his goats. He had a herd initially of 200. He was down to his last 20 because of severe drought. Um, Constance O'Kellett, who's one of the stories in the book from Uganda, told her story of her village being destroyed by a flooding um, in 2009, uh, 2008. Sorry. Um, uh, there was a woman from Mali um, uh, who told her story. There was a Roybosch tea farmer with her husband, um, and she talked about you know, the drought in, in South Africa had uh, wiped out their farm. Um, probably the most telling story, and it really depressed Archbishop Tutu, was the woman from Malawi, because she said, so bad are things with us that women in my village are now turning to prostitution, survival sex, as they call it, because it was so bad. And, I could see that Archbishop Tutu was becoming really very depressed by these stories. He had been jolly and welcoming at the start, and he went down. And I said to these five farmers, you know, I come from the west of Ireland with these four brothers, and my, our parents were both doctors, medical doctors, and my father used to go out on long calls to poor farmers in the west of Ireland, and he loved them, and he loved the way of life. He talked a lot about the farming, but he, he, he said one thing, he said, I warn you, Mary, farmers always complain about the weather. They complain it's too hot, it's too cold, there isn't enough rain, there's too much rain, always complaining about the weather. So in order to lighten the mood, um, I said to this group of farmers, you know, is that what you're doing? You know, you're farmers, are you just complaining about the weather? And I remember it was Constance, and she actually stood up, and she looked me in the eye quite se severely, actually, and she said to me, this is outside our experience. And I've thought about that a lot since then. What is the experience in an African village? When a grandparent talks to a grandchild and then that grandchild grows up and talks to their grandchild, 
it's probably about 200 years. But what Constance was saying was this isn't us complaining about something that's happened and it's a little bit worse for the last four or five years. This is outside our experience. And that, I think, sums up the, the, the human dimension now of affecting a changing climate. Yes, the climate does change and has changed and will go on changing, but we've aggravated it in a way that's really, really very serious. And it's not just farmers in Africa or in Sweden or even folks who live in Houston, Texas, or in you know, California, which had the wildfires. It's folks who live in an inner city with, absolutely. with brick buildings yes. that are feeling the effects mm. of climate change. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and it, you know, one of the women um, that I write about in the book is from Australia, um, a middle-income woman who had her cosme small cosmetics business. And she actually saw a film, uh, Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, and it kind of hit home. She said, oh my goodness, I must go home and see what I can do. And she started to recycle more carefully, not to use waste, to turn off lights, to pull out plugs. She, her products came in a lot of plastic yeah, containers. Uh, yeah, her, 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 her cosmetics used a lot of paper and plastics, and, that, uh, and she realized, and she cut down on that as much as she could as well, but she was still trying to sell, sell her stuff, as she said. And she discovered that she was um, saving money. Um, she saved 10%, first of all, of, of her budget, then 20% with a bit more rigor. She said, this is a great idea. I'll get one million women to do this. So she formed a one million women project. And you can Google, it's, it, the one is a one million women. And she's now got a lot of women who are following her. But it was very difficult in the beginning. Why? Because she had embraced this very personally. But when she talked to people, they said, oh, yes, I'll try that out. But they were busy. They had other things on their mind. And a child would get sick, or the mortgage had to be paid, or whatever. And they didn't stick with it as much. And she, now she's got an app that helps. And she's combining with being able to get carbon credits that help women in developing countries. She's really made this um, uh, much more attractive. And she's got more women um, involved. But the truth is, you can help your household budget just by being more energy efficient, recycling more carefully, et cetera. And that's good for the planet. But it won't be enough to save the world. It gets me back to the poll we started with, where 72% of Americans now feel that climate change affects them personally. That same poll shows that only 62% of Americans believe that climate change is human-made. Um, and a, one of the theories behind the poll is that the Americans are realizing because of the wildfires in California, because of the hurricanes in North Carolina this year, or last year in, in Houston, and the flooding and the devastation they caused, that, OK, oh, this is a problem now. Is that what's happening in this country? Is that, you know, it, it's something sort of esoteric and theoretical until we see all these wildfires and we see flooding in, in the streets of Houston. Is that, we had to get sort of punched in the, in the gut a bit to realize it's a problem? I think for far too long, um, scientists who've been tracking all this and who see that the Earth is warming and they can track it very scientifically. And we had a recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change with a stark warning to us that we might come back to. But um, they don't communicate it well, and people don't feel this is something personal for them. It's too, it's too big an issue. And they sort of say, well, you know, if it's happening, there's nothing I can do about it. And I'm really of the view we have to now think again. I believe that we have to make this absolutely a personal issue for every single member of the family, every single person listening has to not only make it personal, but do something to respond. And what I've done is I've become a pescatarian, meaning I, I no longer eat meat. I only eat fish. Now, believe me, I love meat. Corned beef? I, that includes corned no, beef? No, no. Lamb from the west of Ireland. You okay. can't beat it. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and it, it costs me. But I'm doing it deliberately because scientists are telling us this part of the world should be eating less meat. You don't have to give up meat completely, as I've done, but eat less meat. Some people are becoming vegetarian or even vegan, young people in particular, and that's up to them. But we can all do something. We can recycle more. We can be more energy efficient. We can contribute to um, uh, support groups who are uh, active on climate and active on, on sust sustainability. You've just, there's just been a sustainability institute launched here in Ohio um, State, which I'm very pleased about. Um, and that's the first thing to take it personally and do something you wouldn't otherwise have done. And then to say, OK, 
I've done my bit now. I, I, I've come to terms with, I've done something. And get angry with the lack of government response that is needed, because that's what's needed. We need to understand that we need to put a real price on carbon, which means putting up gas prices. We must do it fairly in a way that doesn't hurt people. In fact, the benefit of the gas price should go back to families, not to some pocket of government. Mm -hmm. but, but, but still, we need to do it, because we need to get out of fossil fuel. And then we need to imagine the better world we'll have when it's a world of clean energy. And uh, we need innovation. We need to be excited about this world um, where, um, apart from anything else, we could take an awful lot of people out of poverty, the people I was talking about who never switch a switch um, to uh, um, who, who um, heat their, uh, light their homes with kerosene and candles. And that's a billion people in our world of 7.6 billion, you know, one seventh of our world. Yeah. Is that part of the problem that it's a, it's a global problem and it is so huge? And how can I, a person in Columbus, Ohio, by maybe eating half as much meat as I do now, or maybe recycling a little more, use cloth napkins instead of paper napkins. I'm not going to affect the, the global climate. Is that if, part of the problem? If you only did it, but if the population of the United States did it, that would already have an impact. Mm -hmm. That would already have an impact. It wouldn't be enough, but it would be you know, a significant move in the right direction. And you see, we have to move in the right direction because I want to come back now to this intergovernmental panel sure. on climate change. Um, as you heard when I was kindly introduced by the provost, um, I was, before the Paris Climate Agreement, the special um, envoy of the UN Secretary General on climate change. So I was following the negotiations, I was part of all the discussion, and it was because the presidents of small island states pleaded over and over again that we had to have a goal written into the Paris Agreement that we needed to stay well below two degrees further of warming, um, uh, uh, two degrees Celsius of warming, and we had to work for 1.5 degrees of warming because above 1.5 degrees, Kiribati, the Maldives, um, Tuvalu, and other small island states would just go under, and they were pleading for the future of their countries, and they were listened to. And it was a wonderful moment in Paris when we got that agreement to stay well below two degrees and work for 1.5 degrees. But the point really was nobody had studied this before. Climate scientists around the world had given up on 1.5. Hmm. And they were almost giving up on two degrees. So they were asked by the Paris Climate Agreement, do a study together, all of you, a thousand climate scientists from around the world, do a study on two questions. What's the difference between 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial standards yeah. the, um, and two degrees? Um, and what they came to was, uh, as for, that was the first question, what's the difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees? And the second question is, if it's important, how do we stay at 1.5 degrees as a world? The difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming turns out to be really significant. And I hadn't realized this. I thought we were doing this for the small island states to stop them going underwater. What the scientists have now told us is no, it's much more serious than this. Uh, between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, things happen. The coral reefs disappear. The Arctic ice disappears and the permafrost begins to melt seriously. And then we're into what the scientists call loopback territory. So at two degrees, we're in the outer um, limit of what is a livable world for our children and grandchildren. That's pretty stark. Why weren't they looking at these studies at two degrees? Because the way it had worked out, the world um, hadn't, um, hadn't committed to staying below 1.5, to staying at or below 1.5 degrees. Literally, it hadn't been said that we would do this. Mm -hmm. And we didn't understand, you see, what's happening, as I understand it, I'm not a scientist, I read these things, I follow it as best I can, but by God, I follow it. Um, everything's happening quicker than scientists thought. This is what's happening. Um, they were predicting and predicting that something would happen in 2050 or 2060. And we all got into a kind of mood. Um, it's a problem, but it's a bit of a problem of the future. Mm -hmm. It's happening more and more now. And that's why you're having this intensity of even the, um, the Arctic, um, whatever they call it, um, that this region is suffering, 
and, and suffered for the last couple of years, that's climate related. That's climate change related. Mm -hmm. It used to be like that. But the Arctic is now warming so much, it's affecting how much coal stays where it stays. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, um, uh, and then the scientists have said, um, we need to stay as close to 1.5 as we can, preferably at 1.5 and not above it. We might have to go above it and then suck out carbon out of the atmosphere to come down to 1.5, but that's a safer level. And they said, that means that we need to um, reduce global greenhouse emissions by 45% by 2030. When they said it, it was 12 years, because that was last October. It's now 11 years, because we're into 2019. Um, 11 years away, reduce um, coal, oil, gas um, by 45% in order to be able to be at zero carbon, zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. That's the only way we stay at 1.5. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be very difficult, particularly for countries like the United States, where there's a real dependence and there's a, a dependence of families, workers on coal, oil, gas, and we have to make a, a much more rapid transition than people thought. I want to I want to get to the politics in a moment, but one of the things I think that also is hard to overcome is just this morning, I was listening to our radio station and the BBC, and they had a story on the air about how the Bering Sea, uh, up off the coast yeah. of Alaska, there's, there's changes, climate change is there, it's causing the water to warm, and the scientist or the expert they talked to said that unless something magical happens, it's too late for the Bering Sea. So as a person, who is maybe ambivalent to climate change, hmm. hears that and says, well, if it's too late, why should I do anything? Hmm. How, how do you answer that? Well, for me, it's very personal. I'm lucky enough as an Irish grandmother to have six grandchildren, and they range in age from 15 to one and a half. And they will be in their 30s and 40s in 2050. We know that they will share the world with a much bigger population. It could be as much as nine and a half billion. We're at about 7.6 billion at the moment. And that's pretty guaranteed because they, that's what the, the UN is predicting in population terms. So a bigger population and the stresses that we're already seeing at one degree, we're at one degree now, globally, one degree of warming, and we can't go above 1.5 degrees. Uh, if we don't take the actions, what's going to happen to our children and grandchildren when they're in their 30s and 40s or older? And there'll be among you young who are, haven't had children yet or who have young children. What, what's it going to be like? Um, children are beginning to react. Um, there was a girl from Sweden who spoke at the latest conference on climate in Poland, a 15-year-old. She was invited to speak because she has skipped school every Friday for the last year to stand outside the Swedish parliament with a placard saying, you are not doing enough to protect me and my generation. Sweden is actually quite a good country on climate. <laughs> you know, that's the irony, but it's not good enough. And she knows that and she's right. So um, she's standing. Um, are they excused absences on Friday? Well, um, uh, the interesting thing is Australia is not good on climate, has, is suffering the worst heat. All the records for heat are being broken in Australia at the moment. And recently, Australian school children have been going out of school on Fridays, copying this young Swedish girl. And the Prime Minister of Australia gave out publicly to the children and said, go back to school. You should be in school on Fridays. You should be learning. And they said, why should we be in school when we're not going to have a future? You know, so. There's a kind of thinking going on, yeah. and young people are realizing this is about them. This is about, you know, their, um, what kind of life, what kind of, and, and the problem is that when I talk like that for a while, it can be scary, and then all the energy goes out of the room, and all the hope goes out of the room, whereas I'm on the other side of it. I am very hopeful, and the, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that made that stark report last October said it is absolutely doable. We can. Um, uh, get rid of the fossil fuel in that time, we can um, live at, in, a, in a much healthier and hopefully much more equal world um, and get people out of poverty more easily by the clean energy. And it's not too late. It's a lot it's of work, not, it's, but not it's not too late. late. And all it needs is the political will 
And there it's a problem because politicians, whether it's in this country or all over the world, in Ireland and everywhere, and I've been in most places that I'm talking about, the horizon is so short. It's the next election. It's six months or a year or at most five years. And it's hard to get them to understand that they actually have to be thinking. Business leaders that are not fossil fuel business have become much more keen on um, governments being more ambitious about climate. I'm, I'm work, work, I work with a lot of business leaders now on this issue, and they've written to government ministers, they've written to the G7, they've written to the G20, saying, please put in place a price on carbon that will help us to move more rapidly. We're living in an interesting political time in this country now, as you, as you I had noticed. Know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You talk about the Paris Accords, <laughs> monumental achievement, 199 countries, large and small, signing on, the, trying to keep the global warming under two degrees, well below two degrees, uh, zero carbons by 2050. 18 months later, President Trump pulls us out of the Paris Accord. You suggest in the book that that might have not been a totally bad thing, that Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of that accord. It certainly doesn't help but it emboldened others to do other things. Yeah, I, I think it was a bad thing, but it did have a good reaction. That, that was what I was saying in the book. Yeah. And I, I, I was very pleased to see um, a kind of broad coalition, and they call themselves, we are still in, meaning we are still in the Paris Climate Agreement. And it's states of the United States, it's cities, a very significant number of cities, putting these targets of trying to reduce their emissions, trying to get to net zero. Um, it's business. It's um, universities, um, including um, Ohio State with its you know, sustainability measures. Um, it's um, philanthropy, um, and it's increasingly investors and insurance companies, because they see that um, uh, you know, the word stranded assets was used quite recently, you know, a few years ago now, to me, and I didn't know what was meant. Um, they said, Coal, particularly, and soonest, but also oil and gas will become stranded assets. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And the person said, think asbestos. Too dangerous to use. And it will come to the stage where coal globally will be too dangerous to use. There are people pleading that coal is already too dangerous to use. But then we have to think about the workers and the families that depend on the coal. We, in other words, we need what's called a just transition. And in the book, there's a story of a miner from Canada, from New Brunswick. Um, he was a union leader in a mine in New Brunswick, which he knew would have to close. So he worked very hard as a union leader to delay, delay, delay the closure, and then get as much concessions as possible, retraining, um, credits, special measures. and he admits that actually when the mine closed, it devastated New Brunswick, it devastated the town. And despite all their efforts, he got a job in the tar sands, the other side in Alberta, the other side of Canada. He's now working as a union leader in Alberta, knowing that it's going to have to close, probably even you know, sooner than people, because it's very viable at one level, because of the greenhouse gas impact of it. And he's now working even harder on this just transition. And I don't think we've taken seriously enough at all, and I know in Ohio this is a concern of yours, I don't think we've taken seriously enough that this is going to be a big investment in people, investment in training and retraining those who are young, pensioning off those who contributed to the economy through working as coal miners for 30 years, 30, 40 years, whatever whatever is decided. And it, 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 there has to be a real investment in this. It was discussed more in Poland than in any other conference, because Poland yeah. has a lot of coal, and they understand And in Katowice, where the conference took place, used to be a coal area, and has become a modern, state-of-the-art um, um, uh, IT area. And they were trying to model that as being a good example. It takes time. Pittsburgh is an example in this, in this country. It's yeah. you know, being the, the old steel mills. Now it's a, a technology and, and medical mm. uh, city. Uh, what is the difference between the European attitudes on climate change and American attitudes on climate change? I would say there's much, much less climate denying in Europe. There is, um, in the UK, in the popular press, 
there's you know, quite a bit, and there are some conservative politicians, but there are fewer. Um, the UK has good climate policy overall, um, and uh, the populist movements tend to be um, uh, whipping up um, uh, an anti-climate feeling. So it's beginning to be part of populism mm -hmm. in some measures. Um, uh, you know, the, talking about the coal workers in a way that isn't helping the coal workers is not saying just transition and put in place proper funding. It's saying we'll save your jobs because you know because you've got a great future. Is there a war on coal in, in Europe? Like the um, there, there are a lot of um, a lot of European countries are leading, um, as Canada has been leading the. Um, uh, move out of coal, yeah. but it's you know it's progressive with just transition. It's it's a it's, it's a but it's definitely saying we have to get out of coal. The politicians using that phrase that you know I don't know Theresa May is now doing a war on coal like Barack Obama was. Or, they're not not there yet like we were in 2016. Um, no, they are. They, they are, are there. Okay. Yes, they yeah. are there. Yeah. yeah. No, there's quite a movement um, of countries and of companies and I think um, uh, um, uh, to to get out of coal. Which well, it showed it worked here at least politically in the short term. Yeah. To get yeah. Donald Trump elected. Uh, yeah. Um, we're we're going to take audience questions. I believe there are two microphones here. Uh, make your way to the microphone. Um, as you, uh, so we'll get to your questions in, in just a moment. Um, I can't let you, we'll get back to climate change in a moment, but I've got to get your thoughts on Brexit. Um, <laughs> Ireland is the, is the sticking point, believe yes, it or not. Yes. Because you know, if, if, if the UK leaves Brexit and they have, open, they have the borders closed, no more free flow of people and goods across mm. uh, borders. But the problem is in Northern Ireland and Ireland, there is a border and it's mm. been open for 30 years and it's been credited with helping keep the peace. Mm. It's been very quiet there. Mm. Is that border gonna stay open? Well, I was president from 1990, December 1990 to September 1997 the Good Friday Agreement was 1998, yep. and we were building such momentum for peace. I was inviting women from the two communities, cross-community efforts, all of this working, working, everybody was working to get the Good Friday Agreement. It was an amazing step forward, and then it was built on further, and then we got the joint executive, and we got peace in Northern Ireland. And when you've lived, as I have growing up, uh, with constant violence, killings, maiming, kneecapping, constant problems, and then you get peace. Yep. It's so precious. And if that border does reappear, and it has to reappear if there is not agreement, because Ireland will be in the European Union, and the Un Northern Ireland and the UK won't. So you have to have a border. And it has to be managed, and I think, then we believe, and I think it's quite strongly held on both sides of the island of Ireland, there are still those who've hidden their guns, they haven't gone away, mm -hmm. who would be back as big, strong men, yep. back, you know, doing the awful things they were doing, mm -hmm. and it could easily unravel, and that is quite a fear of my country. Mm -hmm. We also view Brexit as the most incredible own goal by a country. We can't believe that Britain our big neighbor, who used to be such an efficient, big, you know, powerful country, is literally, you know, shooting itself in the foot and becoming so dysfunctional and so divided. And, oh. doesn't, and we still don't know whether there's going to be a Brexit. And Sounds it's the 29th of March, you know? Shooting yourselves in the foot and dysfunction, government, where, where else does that, does that occur? <laughs> so here's a, here's a question. Which comes first, a solution to climate change or a Brexit deal in, in England? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, the Brexit deal has a time scale on it, um, <laughs> which is pretty, um, really worrying, the 29th of March, because it t it's going to take um, legislation to change that. Mm -hmm. Legislation, as I know, takes time, takes political agreement, takes coming together. I hope that common sense will break out, but we're, we're worried in Ireland. We really are. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not a comfortable position to be in, to be buffeted by a neighbor. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the sad thing, and the genuinely sad thing is, the relations between Ireland and Britain before this had come to the best moment ever. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth II paid a visit to Ireland. She was impeccable. She bowed in the right place. She did everything. She's very popular now in Ireland. Uh, our president, President Higgins, went to the United Kingdom, got a great state visit. They pulled out all the stops. Um, ministers in the European Union worked closely together. And the friendship, the everything was, you know, and, 
Ireland in the short term is gaining from Brexit because companies are moving and people are moving to Ireland. There's a huge demand for Irish passports, huge demand at the moment. Um, but we know that if, especially if it's a hard Brexit, this will not compensate for the dislocations and the, and the stupidity of it. You know, it makes no sense. Okay. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience. Now we ask that you be brief and end each sentence, or at least the final sentence, with a question mark. So we can get everybody <laughs> get, get, who wants to ask a question a chance. So go ahead, please. All right, so my question um, is referring to the refugee crisis that we're already experiencing. So since there will be people displaced by climate change, how will we um, deal with the additional refugees that will be kind of uh, impacted? Thank you very much. That's a really, really important question. And my foundation worked very hard. My foundation on climate justice worked very hard with the global compact on migration, which was being discussed at the UN level and which was adopted in Marrakesh in November, um, and, oh, sorry, in December. Um, we worked very hard to have recognition of what we call climate displaced people in the global compact, which has now happened, because um, climate doesn't, isn't necessarily the sole cause of people having to move, but it's um, it's the threat multiplier which makes whatever the cause is, whether it's conflict or whether it's worse. So um, uh, um, um, it's predicted that we could have as many as 200 million climate displaced people by about 2050 if we don't get on top of climate change. 200 million people in different parts of the world. Where would they go? What, what, what kind of disruption? So it's a hugely important issue. And it's an issue that the elders that I belong to and that I'm chair of now are very concerned about. We have to, we have to uh, get back to having a human approach to this issue. Um, you know, when we had our terrible famine in Ireland in 1845, 46, 47, so many people came to this country and they were not prevented. They were, there was no wall. They were, um, they, what they had to do was prove they were healthy enough to be able to climb the steps at, at Ellis Island, because if they had a disease, they were sent back. That was the only reason they would be sent back. Um, if they were, no matter how poor, no matter how everything, they, they were, and, and that's, that's been the history of mobility, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I, I, what, what the elders did to honor Nelson Mandela last year, we had a, a campaign involving um, communities all around the world to walk together in the other's shoes, to try and see from the other's perspective, particularly the migrant's perspective. Somebody, you know, in Honduras, who has to leave because there's such violence and they've been threatened maybe by a mob or they have to keep their children away from this life and find a life out of the deep poverty and, 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 they, and they have to come to the border and then to be separated at the border. You know, the inhumanity of it. Um, but it's happening also in Europe. Europe is closing its doors. Um, people are dying getting across the Mediterranean. We have to realize that this is an issue that we have to manage, which is why the Global Compact on Migration is incredibly important. We have to manage it because it will get worse because of climate change. Hopefully it won't get as bad as 200 million people, but we know it will be, that will be an aggravating factor on, on mobility. You write about an island in the Pacific where the president, I believe, yes. is actually out looking for places to move his people. Yeah. Yeah. Other the, islands, yeah. other countries, like yeah. sort of looking for a new yeah. house. Yeah. Well, one, of the, one of the stories is, is a, um, the president of Kiribati at the time um, uh, came to Copenhagen to that conference I mentioned in the hope that he would hear a commitment to the staying at 1.5 or below. He didn't hear it. He went back to his people and he said, we have no hope, we have no future. And he bought land in Fiji. He paid $6 million at that time to buy land so that if, when the time came, his people could migrate with dignity. And then he started a kind of fight back and he's mm -hmm. fighting back now. He's actually trying to raise his islands. See, they're small, low atolls but they could be raised. If we can put spaceships up in space, we can raise islands and have a sovereign country continue, you know? Not impossible. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us. Um, I'm a student here at Ohio State, and over the summer I had the opportunity to travel abroad to Uganda, and there I got to see firsthand how um, there is such a significant dependency on stuff like charcoal, and um, like you had talked about earlier. Uh, also, in one of my classes, I got to see 
the effects of in the past when we've put ideas that have been created in the West and tried to integrate them into the developing world. There's been issues that have led to conflict. Uh, what, what has been done so far to try to approach it in a different way so that as we explain these things to people who may not have been uh, able to listen to the climate conference um, to make sure that it can be adapted peacefully in their communities? Again, that's a very good question and that's um, you know, something that we, what we've tried very hard to do is to get the voices of frontline um, defenders, as we often call them, of, um, of their communities. Um, those who are um, working on um, how the community responds to drought followed by flash flooding or a hurricane or whatever. Um, and we've, um, the um, group of women ministers on gender and climate change have actually included indigenous women and grassroots women in their delegations so they could come to conferences and not only tell their story but tell how and in what way they wanted to be supported and they wanted to be helped. Not the ideas coming in from the outside, but listening. You're, you're quite right. That, that, that's really very important. And um, there's a lot of indigenous wisdom on um, nature. Um, indigenous peoples live very well and very closely with nature, understand nature, read nature. Um, one of the things that's a problem, and David Attenborough has been saying this at the conference, is that the modern um, lifestyle takes us away from nature too much. And, and that's part of the problem, but um, we need um, to understand that, uh, and the book is full of the stories of people um, doing it uh, in a way that's in harmony with their reality. And, um, and, and that's the way that they should be helped. We, we shouldn't kid ourselves that all indigenous people or people in these poor countries are all in the same mindset when it comes to climate change. You tell the story of deforestation. Yes. How that's a great way to c capture carbon and yeah. to also help the, the you know the ero control yeah. erosion. Thing. But that ran into resistance in developing countries that relied on that wood for their income. Yeah, I mean there's uh, there's there's both logging, which is very severe, and there's um, cutting down trees for firewood, um, and uh, communities are learning. And, and the Vietnam story is a very Vietnam, good story yeah. of where um, local people were encouraged to kind of. Um, um, you don't own land in the way you own land here in Ohio or in, in Ireland, um, but um, they were allowed to um, develop the fruits of the forest, um, the medicines, the uh, fruits, the trees themselves, um, uh, harvesting them in a very managed way. And that preserved the forest from logging, which is the big problem there. And, um, uh, you know, I was talking to your professor of soil who got the Japanese prize, I can't remember his name now, at lunchtime. Um, and he was talking about the need to support farmers to, um, uh, to uh, by what they do with the soil, um, um, uh, put the carbon back into the soil. And that could be extraordinarily valuable. And, I mean, he's absolutely right. I mean, he, uh, and if, if uh, if we had uh, a program of support for small farmers to have conservation agriculture, to put the carbon back into the soil in, in, in the way that he's talking about, that would help a lot as well, and it would help small farmers immensely in developing countries. Okay. Thank you. Hi, so we talk a lot about personal and community responsibility for uh, decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, but a report um, from CDP in 2017 said that uh, about 100 corporations are responsible for over 70% of the world's uh, carbon emissions. So how do we go about engaging those corporations and hmm. reducing their emissions? Yeah. yeah, it's a very good point and it's true that you know a relatively small number of corporations are responsible because they're, they're, they're generating the coal or the oil or the gas. Um, and the, um, for you know, the, the emissions. There are several things happening. Um, Pope Francis is having conferences with some of these leaders. I've been invited to one, I'm not sure if I can go in June um, to one of these conferences because I'm chair of the elders, to actually talk um, privately and see you know, how, uh, how it's possible to devise um, a kind of financial way forward um, either use carbon in a different way or, you know, but, but stop burning the carbon, which is what's causing the emissions. Um, and um, there are lawsuits now taking place. Um, different states here in the United States are suing some of the um, uh, um, coal and gas companies. Um, the Philippines 
um, uh, the Human Rights Commission in the Philippines has an action against the major oil polluters, um, oil and gas polluters there. Um, so, um, you know, uh, in different ways, um, pressure has been put on them. And some of the oil companies are, you know, um, now trying to invest also in clean energy. In fact, many of them are trying to invest in clean energy, but they're still staying very invested in fossil fuel. Thank you. Uh, I'm an international studies student at OSU, and I, I've observed, as I'm sure you have, that one of the most pressing issues of our day will be uh, state sovereignty and the national right to self-determination versus the importance of global, go global governments and collective action. Uh, you've been both the head of state of a nation as well as a member of a supranational organization like the UN. Uh, do you think that it, the Balancing Act is tipping in one way or another, and in which direction do you think we should place our emphasis? Thank you. It's a very interesting question. Um, there's no doubt we are seeing more nationalism, more populism uh, based on identity that's linked to a kind of nationalism. But uh, the problems that we have can only be solved with a multilateral solution. Um, 2015 was a very good year for multilateralism. We had two major uh, frameworks. Um, I've talked a lot about one of them, the Paris Climate Agreement. That was in December of 2015. But in September 2015, 193 countries agreed to the 2030 agenda with its sustainable development goals. I hope, given that you've been talking as a community about sustainability, you've been talking about the 2030 agenda and the 17 sustainable development goals, because they're for all countries. And they really address the issues of sustainability for the world. Um, the problems cannot be solved by state sovereignty. We're too interconnected now. Um, and pollution doesn't stop at borders. And you know, uh, um, uh, the impacts um, of um, uh, the um, pollution, the, the forest fires go, go across borders. Um, so um, uh, in Asia, you know, people are affected by Chinese pollution that are not living in China. They're affected by Indonesian pollution that are not living, you know. So we need to solve these problems um, in a multilateral way. Now, as I've mentioned, I served for five years full time as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I've served in a number of capacities. I served as the Special Envoy of the Secretary General for the Great Lakes in Africa. I served twice in a climate related thing. So I've served the UN. My attitude to the UN is a bit like what Winston Churchill said about democracy. He said, democracy is the worst system except for all the others. <laughs> The UN is the worst system, but we don't have any other. <laughs> so I'm very loyal to this UN, which drives me crazy. You know, working in the UN is quite difficult because it's quite bureaucratic. But when it achieves objectives, it's really important. And if we didn't have the UN, planes wouldn't fly. We wouldn't know the weather. Um, children would die enormously uh, that don't die now, and so on and so on and so on. There are so many different ways. Um, so we need the multilateral system. We need reform of the multilateral system. I'm very open to that. It needs to be more efficient. I wish it would be, but, but actually um, take the ozone layer. That, that's the best example I can think of when we're talking about climate. Do you remember a few years ago, we were scared because in both poles, there was an opening of the ozone layer and it was going to fry us. And the world got together with a Montreal protocol very, very quickly and we've had an amendment to that, a Kigali protocol amendment to it, to strengthen it, to realize that we had to have a safe future. We're in the same thing with climate change, but it's more complicated, and people don't see it as easily, but it is exactly the same thing. We must have a multilateral solution to it, um, and we have to work. That's what the elders are very committed to, a good multilateral system that's fair. We were talking earlier, you were in, in Boston, or Cambridge in 1968, and so you've been a long observer of international politics. You've seen a lot of strife over those years. Why do you think there is a rise in nationalism, not just here in this country, but in Europe and other parts of the world? What's fueling it? I think it's been fueled by a number of things. One is the inequality in our world. 
I mean, it really is striking. Um, Davos is taking place at the moment, as we probably are aware, and it comes on the television channels, etc. And Oxfam, which I was honorary president of for a number of years, Oxfam produce a report for every Davos. And every year, that report shows the inequality is even worse. Now, the headline figure is 26 individuals own as much wealth as half the world, wow. as 3.6 billion people. That is shocking and unacceptable. It's not a question of blaming those 26 individuals as such. It's the system that allows that. It's a rampant capitalism that has forgotten its social compact. It's forgotten that this should be fair across the board and people should have fair wages. Um, it's a, 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 a capitalism that's crushing trade unions so that people don't have a fair way of bargaining in their workplace. Um, all of this is um, part of what is alienating people. And then the problems um, of trade um, are such that um, trade itself seems to be the problem, global trade. But actually, the problem is technology also, automation. And we have to learn how to cope with these problems in a way that um, doesn't have people going back into their um, sort of isolationist tra um, sovereignty yeah. bubble, but rather working together in a multilateral way to say, how do we ensure that young people coming into the world, and there will be more and more of them, our population is going up, so there'll be more and more people looking for jobs. How do we look at um, the workplace and jobs as a whole? Do we need to talk about basic income? That's something that is being discussed more. Um, you know, these are the big issues, but we will only really address those issues well if we do it in a, in a, in a fair multilateral system. Yeah, more cold jobs were lost to automation or machinery than regulation. Exactly. By far. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm a student from Ohio University, not the Ohio University, so I hope I'm allowed to speak here. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a question regarding the necessary transition away from fossil fuel intensive uh, mining and extractive industries. Um, do you view the, uh, that as an opportunity to retrain workers and to retrain that employment force as a way to become uh, leaders in the green energy and clean energy sectors? And how do you get people to change their minds towards that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad you asked the question because I just can't emphasize enough how important that issue is. We have to move very rapidly out of fossil fuel. There are workers in fossil fuel and the families of those workers and the business that depends on the, and if we don't get real about planning for that transition, then it's not gonna happen in a proper way and it's probably not gonna happen quickly enough and our world will suffer and our children and their children will never forgive us for not having the imagination and the, you know, the, the sort of, innovation and, and, the, and um, the first thing this needs is a lot of resourcing, a lot of thought, a lot of um, recognition that it is an absolute priority to um, uh, focus on the communities that need to evolve fastest. Um, I actually had a conversation, uh, I, I have a podcast now called Mothers of Invention. I was saying this when I was having a lunch with some of the uh, faculty and um, uh, it's about climate change, and I'm doing it with a young Irish woman based in New York who's a comedian. So it's, quite, it's kind of funny in places too. So those of you who like a bit of a laugh about climate, um, <laughs> uh, try Mothers of Invention. But um, we were doing a live, uh, uh, sorry, a, a new recording of a new episode, and I was talking to a climate scientist, a woman in Botswana in Africa. She's a member of this intergovernmental panel on climate change, and we were talking. And she said in a very sympathetic way, I really feel for the problem of developed countries now in adapting to what is needed for climate change. Because you know, in our countries, we can start to build our economies on clean energy. We need the resources, we need technology, but we, we can build. But rich countries have to unwind. They're, they're dependent on it, they can't suddenly stop. They've got to do it gradually. They've got to do it in a planned way. And she was very, very sympathetic to the problem, which I found you know, was interesting, that she had the empathy to know that it's difficult when you've got to change from a situation where you have workers and families and communities and businesses dependent on the production of coal or the production of, of oil or gas. So we need to get real about this in a huge way. 
And I mean, your question is, is, is highly relevant. And training and retraining is part of it, but it's much more than that. You have time for, for one more question. Hello, my family comes from County Cavan, Ireland, so it's an honor to speak with you today. When we look at the human level, we see that climate injustice brings together the female farmer in Chad and the coal miner in West Virginia. But at a national level, where much decision making is being made, we see walls being built to keep out refugees, and an oil war will soon become a water war. My question is, how do we avoid a future where overt militarization between countries becomes an adaptation to climate change? Yeah, I think that's a worrying question. <laughs> yes. Uh, um. <laughs> on a high note. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to end on a, a note of hope, if I there may. There we go. May I do that? <laughs> You know, there are times when the issues seem difficult and, and there are concerns. And I learned a huge lesson a few years ago here in the United States, in New York, from my dear friend, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. You know, I've learned so much from him over the years. Um, we were on a panel together in New York um, in front of a social good conference. And the social good conferences are conferences of young people who are on their iPads and their iPhones you know, tweeting. So you get a great social media coverage. And when Archbishop Tutu is in front of young people, he expresses his love, his arms go out in every direction, tells them his belief in them, etc. And <laughs> the journalist was clearly a bit irritated. And she said in a, quite a sharp voice, a woman journalist, she said, moderating, but not, not nicely like this man. <laughs> she said quite sharply, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he shook his head and he said, oh no, dearie, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. And I was very struck at the time by that expression, but I've thought about it an awful lot since. And we all need to be prisoners of hope because if you're a prisoner of hope, the glass may not be half full. I don't know if you can see, there's less in it because I've been sipping. But what you do is you work with what's in the glass. You work with, and that's what each of the people in the book has done. In that difficulty, they find a way forward. They find a way to be more resilient. They find a way to cope. They find a way to solve the problem. And the more people-centered and the more it's people doing it with courage and resilience, the better. Otherwise, we may have a situation that comes to crisis and talk about a military solution, which is the worst possible idea. So, um, you know, your question got a clap because it's a real question, but I'm a prisoner of hope, and I hope we all are. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. Thanks for the questions. I'd like to thank those that have participated in the Engagement Conference, Partnering for a Sustainable and Resilient Future. It's been an honor and a privilege to have President Robinson here with us today. I hope you'll, you're all inspired and heard the message that we can all do small things, and they all add up. We can't wait for other people to do things for us. Uh, thank, thank her for, I'd like to thank her for being here on such an important topic, and would you join me again in thanking President Mary Robinson.